Okay, 99 years. But somehow, by the time you start listening to this, you're going to start questioning, what year are we in? Uh, my name is Evan Winger. I've been here before and uh, talking about the calendar year 1925, and I probably should shut off some lights here. Um, okay, see that? That's a monkey. That's a monkey. I'm talking about the, uh, or I'm going to talk about the Scopes Monkey Trial in Tennessee. And these guys, they were so blatant back in those days, they marched without their masks in Washington, D.C., down Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, the Great Gatsby was released in 1925. How many of you read The Great Gatsby? A number of you. How many of you had to go to high school because it was required reading in high school? And you know what? It still requires reading in high school. Uh, prohibition, uh, I'm sure that you probably heard stories about Prohibition. Uh, also, the flappers, and I'm sure some of you had relatives, women relatives, who were flappers uh, back in the day. Uh, the president is Calvin Coolidge. He's beginning his first term. Over in Europe, it's Adolf Hitler. And in 1925, he's keeping a very low profile, because he has to. Uh, the Scopes Monkey Trial is where we start. And we start in Dayton, Tennessee, uh, as well. And oh, we got that, Chrysler. How many of you owned a Chrysler? It's a good car? It was a good car. Chrysler was formed in 1925. Yeah, well, they started building the best engines, actually, for Maxwell. Remember the Maxwell? Remember Jack Benny? Jack Benny drove a Maxwell. Maxwell was put out of business. And, uh, oh, Red Grange saves the National Football League. But we go uh, back into the Roaring Twenties and talk about the image of the Roaring Twenties. Uh, it is one of prosperity, riotous living, bootleggers, gangsters, Flappers, hot jazz, flagpole sitters. How many of you would want to sit on a flagpole? <laughs> it hurts. It hurts. But there were flagpole sitters. That's what young people did. They sat on a flagpole. Because Shipwreck Kelly sat on the flagpole in 1924 uh, to promote a movie. And they said, hey, that's cool. Let us sit on a flagpole. Uh, also, uh, marathon dancers. But the 1920s, culturally, wasn't really like that at all. It was a conflict about the city slickers and the people who were living in the rural areas. Cosmopolitans, modernists, urban culture against the more provincial, traditional, and rural culture. And this becomes very evident in July in Dayton, Tennessee. Uh, it's a mixture of religion, science, public schools, and the battle over evolution. And it catches fire in Dayton, Tennessee. It's called the Scopes Trial, the Monkey Trial, the Trial of the Century. And in a way, it was the Trial of the Century because it was a spectacle where monkeys were dressed up in tuxedos walking the street. Um, it dominated newspaper headlines across the country. Not only did it do that, but WGN Radio, which was owned by the Chicago Tribune, called WGN, World's Greatest Newspaper, uh, was there. And they were paying $1,000 a day to AT&T to broadcast live through their telephone lines. That's how big a deal it was. They paid thousands of dollars to talk, talk about what was going on at the monkey trial. It all goes back to this guy, Charles Darwin and uh, evolution. Uh, in 1859, Charles Darwin's The Origin of Species is published. In his introduction, he wrote the view which most naturalists entertain and which I formally entertain, <laughs> namely that each species has been independently created is erroneous. Uh, in 1871, his second book is called The Descent of Man. In this work, uh, Darwin writes that man is descended from a hairy-tailed uh, quadruped, uh, probably Aborelio, Aborelio. Okay, let's start that again. Okay. Oh, Arboreal. 
in that its habits and in the inhabitant of the old world. Uh, and this is a book. It's called A Civic Biology. And it's written by a guy by the name of uh, George William Hunter, PhD. And this book is being used, sort of, in Dayton, Tennessee, in school. Uh, it's written in 1941. A civic biology describes evolution as the belief that simple forms of life on Earth slowly and gradually uh, gave rise to the more complex and thus ultimately the most complex forms came into existence. So this is starting to be used in schools. Uh, it was one of the most widely biology textbooks available in the United States in its time. Hunter also had a belief in the racial hierarchy of the world's population. White Anglo-Saxons were situated at the superior position in this hierarchy, Africans at the bottom. Such beliefs fueled the eugenics movement. Teddy Roosevelt believed in eugenics, uh, which discouraged reproduction among inferior races. Now, that's William Jennings Bryan. Guy ran for president three times, 1896, 1900, 1908. He lost all three times. In 1898, he was uh, basically painted as a religious whack job, a fundamentalist. What party was he running? Against? He was running as a Democrat in 1896. He ran against McKinley in 1896, 1900, and he was part, uh, ran against William Taft in 1908. Lost all three times. Uh, 1921, the three-time. Uh, presidential candidate and loser of three elections, uh, William Jennings Bryant becomes the leader in the anti-evolution movement. Uh, and he gives two speeches that year, the menace of Darwinism and the Bible and its enemies. Uh, Bryant declares in one speech, it's better to trust in the rock of ages than to know the age of the rocks. Uh, it is better for one to know that he is close to the heavenly father then how far the stars in the heaven are apart. That's part of what lost him in 1896. People just disregarded it that way. On January 24th, 1924, Bryant delivers a lecture in Nashville, and it's entitled, Is the Bible True? Uh, copies of the speech are delivered to members of the Tennessee legislature, including a representative by the name of John Washington Butler. Uh, and there is J.W. Butler, John Washington Butler. Uh, on January 21st, 1925, Representative Butler introduces legislation in the Tennessee House of Representatives calling for a ban on the teaching of evolution. The proposed law is known as the Butler Bill and would provide uh, or prohibit the teaching of any theories that denies the story of the divine creation of man as taught in the Bible and to teach instead that uh, man has descended from a lower order of animals. Uh, so this sets all of this up for a court battle. Uh, on January 27th, the Tennessee House of Representatives approves the Butler Bill 71-5. On March 13th, after several hours of heated debate, Tennessee Senate passes the Butler Bill 24-6. On March 21st, the uh, governor, Austin Pay or Austin P rather, uh, signs the Butler Bill into law. The new law is the first in the United States to teach the banning of evolution. Well, the American Civil Liberties Union decides to get involved. How many of you remember the uh, actor and TV game show panelist Orson Bean? Orson Bean. His father was one of the founders of the uh, American Civil, Civil Liberties Union. Anyway, uh, so they put an ad in the paper, and um, they are, want to have a legal test of the Tennessee law, and uh, they will basically defend anybody who's arrested. Well, on May 4th, the Charlotte, uh, uh, rather the Chattanooga newspaper runs an item noting that the American Civil Liberties Union is seeking teachers willing to challenge the Butler Law. The item says the ACLU is looking for Tennessee teachers willing to accept our services in testing this law in the courts. Our lawyers think 
A friendly test can be arranged without costing a teacher his or her job. All we now need is a willing client. And people at Dayton are saying, hey, we can make some money off of this. We need the money. Why don't we find a teacher who's willing to go through this nonsense? And then we'll have a court case here. And then they'll put Dayton on the map. Yeah, let's go for it. And they do. They come up with a scheme. Uh, to bring the case to date, a scheme that they hope will generate publicity and jumpstart the town's economy. And they ask a 24-year-old science teacher and a football coach, John Thomas Scopes, hey, you want to do this? Hey, come on, you can do this. You're not going to get in trouble. And whatever trouble you get in, it's just a fine. So we'll take care of the fine. Don't worry about that. Please, please, can you be the teacher? So uh, Scopes says, yeah. Uh, he's never taught biology. He's taught it as a substitute teacher. And uh, later he says, you know, I don't even know if I even talked about evolution in class. Shh, go ahead, go ahead. We need the money. We're going to make a big spectacle out of it. And so Scopes is arrested uh, on May 7th. And he's arrested for teaching evolution. He was a football coach. He was a science teacher. But he never taught biology. He was filling in as a substitute biology teacher when he taught out of the Bible textbook that included evolution. The textbook, Hunter's a Civic Biology. On uh, May 12th, William Jennings Bryan says, Hey, prosecution, count me in. I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm going to help you out. And uh, when Bryan gets there, former Secretary of State, three-time presidential loser, a uh, guy who goes around, a uh, famous lawyer, a guy who goes around the country giving speeches uh, about the Bible. Uh, they say, yeah, that's great. Bring him in. And a few uh, days later, uh, Clarence Darrow out of the Chicago and Dudley Field Malone said, hey, we'll, we'll uh, do the job. We'll, we'll represent Scopes. May 25th, Scopes is indicted by a grand jury for violating Tennessee's anti-evolution law. To Carnival, it's an absolute carnival in town. T.T. Uh, Martin headquarters, anti-evolution league, the conflict, hell in the high school, buy Brian's books. Was, every day there was somebody there trying to sell you something. It probably was like when you go to Dealey Plaza in Dallas and you see all these conspiracy, uh, conspiracy with their conspiracy theories, trying to sell you books and all that. That's what it was like in Dayton. Exactly. Preparations begin in Dayton for an expected onslaught of trial-related publicity. Six blocks of Dayton's main road are trans, uh, transformed into a pedestrian mall. A speaker's platform is built on the lawn of the courthouse, and a tourist camp is constructed. The money is going to come in. They know it, and they are so happy that they've hatched this plan, and they got Darrow in there, they got Brian in there, they've got monkeys walking around in suits and tuxedos, and it's a carnival, absolute carnival. The courtroom is outfitted with the latest technology to transmit the story to the world. Telegraph and telephone wiring, movie newsreel cameras, platforms, and radio microphones, WGN, they're paying $1,000 a day for tel uh, telephone lines. This is the first trial of the century. It is the first trial ever done for the benefit, like they do now, like the OJ trial in 1994, 95, whatever that was, and other trials. This is the trial of the century. And you get the media attention. And the media attention is there. They are so happy in Dayton, they're making money. And look, they even went outside. They went outside because only X amount of people can be inside. The, the thing was, was courtroom was too hot. So let's go outside where more people can see the spectacle. And that's what happened, even though they claimed the courtroom was way too hot for them to stay in the courtroom during the trial. Outside the courthouse, a circus-like atmosphere reigned. There were barbecues, concessions, Carnival games, uh, though that died as the trial
trial, or that died down when the trial was adjourned for the weekend, during which Brian and Daryl sparred through the press as tensions mounted. Yeah, so let's go outside. We're going to go outside. Trial began on July 10th. Scopes played no role, almost no role in the proceedings. He was kind of an extra in this uh, film extravaganza. He was kind of a walk on cameo role. He really didn't want to be here at all. The most notable occasion of the trial, when Darrow cross-examined Brian about his biblical literal, literal, literalism. Uh, the exchange did not involve Scopes at all. The trial concluded on July 21st. Scopes was found guilty of violating the Butler law, <coughs> fined a hundred bucks. It took the jury all of nine minutes, all of nine minutes to convict him. Uh, even though Brian fought against Scopes, I'll pay the fine. P-A-C-L-U, I'll pay the fine. It was a spectacle. Did it mean anything? No, not at all, not at all. Uh, the expectation all along was that the Scopes would be convicted. The intention was to appeal the conviction and put the Butler Act on trial. The conviction was overturned by a higher court. The case was never retried. Uh, there is William Jennings Bryan, one of the last pictures of William Jennings Bryan. Uh, after the trial, uh, he was going to uh, have a closure statement and uh, that was going to be a speech at his rallies, whatever rallies he was going to hold. But he never got to use that speech. He died five days after the trial in Dayton, Tennessee. John Scopes was offered a new teaching contract but chose to leave Dayton. He studied geology at the University of Chicago uh, Graduate School and then became uh, very involved in, in the petroleum industry. Uh, the Butler Act was never enforced again. It stayed on the books, but nobody enforced it. Uh, Kulovich is uh, inaugurated for his first full term. He took over in office in August 1923, following the death of uh, Warren G. Harding, who uh, passed away uh, from a heart attack in uh, San Francisco in August of 23. On November 24th, Coolidge is elected for the first time as the President of the United States. He became President on August 2nd, 1923. And uh, he basically rallied his opponent, uh, who was John W. Davis, who was a segregationist uh, on the Democratic ticket. Uh, he gets 382 electoral votes, 15,720,000 uh, votes. Uh, Davis, 136 electoral votes, just uh, 8 million 300,000 popular votes, and the progressive candidate, Robert Lafayette, uh, got nearly 5 million votes, but only 13 Why did electoral votes. Uh, yeah. Because he was in the small states. Yeah, just the way he stood in the small states. Uh, on the two most controversial issues of the campaign, prohibition and the Ku Klux Klan, getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but we said almost nothing. Uh, his platform of lower taxes and smaller government resonated with the American public, and he also used this new medium called radio. Now, radio at that point, commercial radio is only four years old at that point, and there are no networks in the United States. It was just a string of individual stations that picked up some of his uh, speeches. Uh, and it was very effective. The campaign, very uneventful. The Roaring Twenties, and this is Washington, D.C., in the summer of 1925. There was a struggle between old and new America. Immigration, there was a big immigration bill that was passed in 1924, which basically kept out Asians and also those people from Eastern Europe. We don't want those people from Eastern Europe anymore, and you can deduce who they were talking about in 1924. It's called the Reed Johnson uh, Immigration Act from 1924. So it was immigration, race, alcohol, evolution, gender politics, sexual morality, all became cultural battlefields. Uh, how much has that changed in 99 years? Maybe you could take out the alcohol. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's it. 
are we still 99 years still talking about the same issues? What do you think? Yes or no? Yeah. Yes. Seems like we are. Uh, wife's battle drives and liquor, religious moderates battled religious fundamentalists. Does that sound familiar today? Uh, and urban ethics battled the Ku Klux Klan. And there they are, Klan parade. If you can't notice something at the bottom of that picture, you know how you know how college bands spell out words? These guys have the K there. They're marching as the K, as in Ku Klux Klan. Uh, on August 8th, the Ku Klux Klan paraded in Washington, down Pennsylvania Avenue. The Roaring Twenties was also a decade in which the newly revived Ku Klux Klan expanded across the country under the guise of uh, enforcing prohibition. The Southern Poverty Law Center reported that by 1925, when its followers staged a huge, yes, back in the 1870s, somebody just said, hey, let's call ourselves the Ku Klux Klan. That's what they did. Uh, as many as four million members and in some states uh, had considerable political power in 1925. Uh, from the beginning, prohibition was tied up with anti-immigration and anti-Catholic biases. Many of the advocates were white Anglo-Saxon Protestants who thought people like them could be real Americans. I think I've heard that on the campaign trail recently. Uh, they believed the country was under siege by Catholic immigrants from countries like Italy, and that these people threatened the U.S. with their foreign drinking habits and their saloons. Uh, that is Binghamton, New York, KKK. And they they didn't care. They were out there. They're there. You can see their faces. Some of them. They didn't care. Hey, we're KKK. Well, they weren't concerned with that. No, no. Uh, the two major organizations that lobbied for national prohibition, the Women's Christian Temperance Union and the Men's anti saloon League, blamed Catholic, immigrate, uh, Catholic immigrants uh, from the 19-teens for the saloon culture. The Wild West, where did the, where did the cowboys end up? In the saloons, right? I mean, you go to Virginia City, right? And uh, if you go to Virginia City, there are old saloons there. Uh, that have been memorialized, uh, where people were shot, people were killed, people drank, people played cards. Uh, and they felt that was plugging the nation. Uh, the League even argued that the U.S. needed to pass a national ban before its demographics changed too much. There is a website called the Daily Stormer that's out there. And it's a Nazi website. And they have the percentage of whites in the United States and how it's trickling down, trickling down, trickling down. This is 2024. That is 1925. Uh, the states ratified the 18th Amendment, uh, which prohibited drinking, on uh, January 16th, 1919, took effect, 1920. Uh, during that decade, the criminal justice system expanded as police disproportionately arrested people who were immigrants, black, poor, and working class. But there were also plenty of prohibition supporting white Protestants who thought the law wasn't doing enough to stop the bootleggers that they read about in the tabloids. Uh, well, the Ku Klux Klan is watching, marching in Washington, and other people are marching as well. Beer, they want beer. They want beer. Uh, the Klan began raiding uh, Catholic immigrant homes, burning down their businesses, planting evidence against them. The Klan wasn't necessarily trying to put these people behind bars, though many immigrants did end up in jail, but rather terrorized these communities. The fact that the Klansmen uh, sometimes seized alcohol only to drink it themselves was a clear sign that their raids weren't just about enforcing prohibition. During the 1920s, the Klan, uh, along with its auxiliary, women of the Ku Klux Klan, and three KKK youth groups spread across the North and South, arguing that Catholics and immigrants, some of the Im immigrants were Jews, of course, and who was uh, one of the big bootleggers of the time, Arthur Rothstein, Arnold Rothstein. 
uh, and only vigilant police like the Klan could put a stop to it. The Klan was so mainstream in some parts of America, particularly the South, some KKK groups sponsored in public baseball teams, father-son outings, beautiful baby contests, weddings, baby christenings, junior leagues, road rallies, festivals. Uh, the Klan is coming because of Woodrow Wilson and this movie called Birth of the Nation, which Wilson screened as President of the United States in the White House in 1915. D.W. Griffin's The Klansman, The Birth of the Nation. Uh, in 1915, that's when this Klan experiences a renaissance. Uh, Birth of the Nation romanced and popularized the uh, terrorist organization. The movie was a hit, and Woodrow Wilson screened it at the White House and gave it a ringing endorsement. Woodrow Wilson was a defender of the Ku Klux Klan. And there are the women of the Ku Klux Klan, one of them holding a baby, again, not hiding their faces. Between 1920 and 1925, the Klan's membership grew to uh, some two to five million members, and there were overlaps with those members, uh, with these new members, and those who supported prohibition. Hey, look, you can see right who they are. They didn't care. You can see exactly who they are. Uh, packaging its noxid, uh, noxious ideology as traditional small town values and wholesome fun. The Klan of the 1920s encouraged native-born white Americans to believe that bigotry, intimidation, harassment, and extra-legal violence were all perfectly compatible with, if not central, to patriotic responsibility. Sounds like the January 6th, 2021 insurrection, doesn't it? Sounds a lot like that. What, those who do not understand history are, are doomed to repeat it, right? Maybe, maybe. The Klan had public parades in Florida, Oregon, Tennessee, and other states. 1917, on Long Island, Ku Klux Klan had a basketball team in East Bridges, New York. When Harding died, the KKK scheduled a silent memorial service at midnight on August 24th, 1923 at the Franklin Fairgrounds in Franklin, Indiana. In the fall, 1923, an outspoken member of the Ku Klux Klan was elected governor, or rather mayor, of Youngstown, Ohio. The Zanesville Times Recorder reported on November 8th that the Klan held a victory celebration for Charles F. Schwibble, who was elected by an overwhelming majority over five opponents. Uh, May 28, 1924, edition of the Indianapolis News told of a planned three-day festival in Indianapolis, uh, or in Kokomo, uh, which is next to Indianapolis, uh, including a pageant with 2,000 men and women in robes, music, a parade, in a high dive exhibition by a Kokomo man from the top of 100 foot tower into a net. Sounds like fun, doesn't it? Uh, the KKK planned a patriotic 4th of July extravaganza in Ancora, Kansas, the Weekly Gazette reported on June 25th. In Pontiac, Illinois, the Ku Klux Klan Quartet. Did you know there was a Ku Klux Klan Quartet? Uh, per play the public uh, concert. The Bloomington Pantograph reported on August 13th. And there was a baseball team. That is the Ku Klux Klan baseball team. There they are. On June 21st, the KKK wanted to improve their public image. Uh, so they decided to have a match against the Negro League baseball team. The game uh, was decided to be against the uh, Wichita Morovians. The Ku Klux Klan would send the Wichita Klan six. There was a statement sent out to newspapers. It's like wrestling. It's just like her wrestling. No strangleholds, no razors, no horse whips, or other violent implements of argument are allowed. And they even have Irish Catholic umpires. Uh, so the KKK could try and make the uh, claim that they were more than just, that they were more than racist, that they were not racist. Oh, the Moravians, they won the game 10 to 8. Uh, and here's the parade in Washington. KKK marched down Pennsylvania Avenue. 
It brought about 25,000 members in full regalia to the city, demonstrating at the height of their power. The KKK was a national fraternal organization founded on the premise of white supremacy. And there they are at night. Lovely night out in Washington. Uh, well, that's probably the peak of their popularity, uh, going down the street, although they did not go away. Coolidge did not make public statement on the march, but in subsequent statements, he was not happy with the march. Uh, and he couldn't stop them either. Uh, in his first State of the Union message in 1923, Coolidge called for a major appropriation to traditionally black school, Howard University, uh, in Washington, D.C. In 1924, Coolidge gave the commencement address at Howard University, an all-black school. Uh, how many of you are going to go up there? How many of you want to sit up there? How many? I take no one. It might be cool for a few minutes. I don't know. 1925, cultural war combatants had one thing in common. They wanted to make money. But most people didn't have the money to do so. For wealthy white Americans, the roaring 20s was a time of immense economic prosperity. Yet for most Americans, it wasn't. Low-wage jobs paid an average of $25 a week for a man, $437 a week in today's money, $18 for a woman, $322 a week in today's money. Uh, the speakeasy, speakeasy party culture popularized in books, movies, magazines, only a small portion of wealthy, urban, and mostly white Americans can get that. Many workers' wages uh, didn't keep up with productivity or fell off completely. Farmers in particular, the Great Depression began after World War I. Banks were failing. So uh, only a handful of you read this book, The Great Gatsby. It sounds about right, because when the book came out, it was a lousy seller. People did not buy the book when it came out. Uh, it was just dismissed. It's no big deal, except to a certain portion of the people. On April 10th, F. Scott Fitzgerald, The Great Gatsby, is released to the public. Uh, set in New York City, Long Island, actually Queens, um, and Queens basically on the Nassau-Queens border. Uh, the Roaring Twenties uh, is the setting. And the story is the focus of its title character, Jay Gatsby, and his unswerving desire to be reunited with Daisy Buchanan, the love he lost five years earlier. Dick Carraway, who happens to be both Gatsby's neighbor and Daisy's cousin, narrates Gat uh, Gatsby's journey from poverty to wealth into the arms of his beloved and eventually to his death. Uh, that's the placard woman of the day. Um, was immortalized. Uh, the novel was a flop. Uh, it sold poorly after its release. It got mixed reviews. Only 20,000 units were sold. The Great Gatsby captured a certain part of the early 1920s. It would be Fitzgerald who uh, coined the term the Jazz Age. Uh, Fitzgerald was, in fact, holding up a mirror to society of which he was part. The Great Gatsby addresses the social issues of the period, materialism, and displacing spirituality. Except nobody cared when the book came out. Uh, set on a prosperous Long Island near the uh, New York City borough of Queens on the Nassau County border, East Egg, uh, that I pass all the time going to Long Island, it's set in New York in 1922. F. Scott Fitzgerald is a fictional narrative of jazz music economic prosperity, the flapper culture, uh, libertine morales, uh, rebellious youth, and speakeasies. Fitzgerald uses many of these societal developments to tell the story from simple details like petting and automobiles. I mean, people sat in the back seat of the car in automobiles in those days and did whatever they did, like I used to witness at the drive-in movie where I worked at the drive-in movie and 1974, 1975, 1970. People did that? I don't know. I'm a Detroiter, and they, yeah. they brought more food across the Detroit. Oh, from Windsor. I'm going to have a, I have a story about that, which I'm going to tell you. Yeah. Uh, to broader things such as boot, 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 bo
plaguing as an elusive source of Gatsby's fortune. That's Edith Cummings. She was known as the fairway flapper. She won an amateur golf tournament and became the darling of uh, Time Magazine. She was on the cover of Time Magazine. She grew up around golf courses in Lake Forest, Illinois. First, uh, she started winning when she was 17. Her brother, Dexter, captured the intercollegiate title twice in the 1920s. Obviously, they had money. Uh, she was famous for the 1924 victory at the Women's Western Amateur, and it made her famous. She was the first athlete ever on the cover of Time Magazine on August 24, 1924, and she makes it in to the Great Gatsby. Uh, published tomorrow, Scott Fitzgerald's new novel, The Great Gatsby. Fitzgerald modeled his character in The Great Gatsby, Jordan Baker, a female golf champion, directly after Cummings. He met her through Ginevra King, the inspiration for Daisy Buchanan. Thomas, Tom Buchanan, Daisy's husband, has certain parallels with uh, William Billy Mitchell, the Chicago businessman who married Ginevra King. So in a way, some of it is real. Uh, speakeasies. Harpo Marx could get into a speakeasy. All you had to do was say the secret word. And there he is, he's saying the secret word. Swordfish. Uh, when Prohibition took effect on January 17, 1920, many thousands of formerly legal saloons across the country came in to men close down. People wanted a drink. Uh, they had to buy liquor from licensed druggists for medicinal purposes, clergymen for religious reasons, and illegal sellers known as bootleggers. Uh, let me tell you about a bootlegger I knew. We talked about Windsor. When I was 18 years old, I worked at the Rockland County Drive-In, or the Rockland Drive-In, Route 59, Muncie, New York, 1974, 1975, 1976. We had a projectionist who was born in 1899, 1900, 1901. I really don't know. Somebody told me he was 73. Somebody told me he was 75. Regardless, his name was Albert Morris, uh, and he was Canadian. He flew during uh, the... Um, uh, dog fights in World War One. Well, at least he tried to. He knew Eddie Rickenbacker, uh, and he knew of the Red Baron uh, from the dog fights. And uh, so he comes home, war's over, and he's living in Spring Valley, and he needs money. He needs a job, and he gets a job. He becomes a bootlegger. So I knew that much about him because people who had worked there before me said, "You need. You're going to go into journalism. It's great. Go interview Al Morris." So I do. I start talking. I said, I uh, hear you were bootleggers. He goes, I said, so what'd you do? He said, well, picked up the stuff and suffering, brought it back to my house, put the bathtub, watered it down, sent it back. I said, well, where'd you get it from? He said, I don't know. Did you get it from suffering? I got it from suffering. Suffering was the end terminus of trades going from Montreal, where remember it's Canadian, or it's, yeah, it's Canadian. Although, it's English, because Canada really is the country to 1931, although it is. Anyway, he gets the, it comes out from Montreal. He picks it up and waters it down and sends it back, goes out to suffer and sends it somewhere out west. So who is it going to out west? I don't know. Is it your home? George Rebus? I don't know. Well, who paid you? I don't know. Well, what do you know? I don't know. This is 1974, 1975, 1976. Prohibition ended in 1933. He's still keeping secrets. He was keeping secrets 41, 42, 43 years later. Mom was the word. That's all I ever got out of him. That's it. You know, yeah, he admitted that he watered down the booze, but he wouldn't tell me who he worked for. It's like Capone was going to come out of the grave to get him. 1974. Anyway, he was also a flyer, and he had uh, two airports that he owned in Rockland County, one in Spring Valley and uh, one uh, toward New City area. Uh, so anyway, another option was to enter private, unlicensed bar rooms, nicknamed speakeasies, for help. Who you had to speak? Uh, the passport uh, to gain entry, as so you would not be overheard by law enforcement officials who were also speaking low to get into speakeasies. Most cops looked the other way. 
Uh, the main law, and this is where prohibition really starts in Maine. The temperance movement had its origins in Maine. The world's first total abstinence society was founded in Portland in 19, 1850. A state organization of temperance societies was formed in 1834. Uh, within a dozen years, it developed enough political clout to force the enactment of a state law prohibiting the sale of alcoholic spirits, except for medicinal and mechanical purposes. Mechanical, what are they giving it to, a tractor? Uh, Portland's Neil Dow was known internationally as the father of prohibition, and he led the way in Maine to prove the total ban on the manufacture and sale of liquor in 1851. Of course, there is a river that separates Maine from New Brunswick. And if you really wanted to get some booze, it wasn't that difficult. Uh, because it could be smuggled in from New Brunswick. Uh, this is Boston. There is a, a, a bar called Carrie Nation. Carrie Nation was one of the people who led the way to ban alcohol. And uh, it says, featuring Boston's original speakeasy. Uh, and it's right down the street from the state house. So I wonder how many politicians went into the speakeasy to relax afterwards. On January 19, 1919, Congress did ratify the 18th Amendment, banning the manufacturer's sale and transportation of alcoholic beverages, which created a new industry called the Rum Runners. And they uh, specially made rum running boats that could travel at a much faster speed than any of the boats that the Coast Guard had in their fleets. This allowed them to avoid being raided, arrested, and having their shipment confiscated by law officials in this abroad. And there are the Grub Runners, and they were probably in Windsor. They were probably, um, well, probably right by Niagara Falls as well. Run Row was set up not long after the federal prohibition was passed, which was a lot of Canadian fishing vessels set up along the Canadian coastline north of Maine. They position themselves just outside the three mile limit. That would be a problem in winter. There's no three miles between winter and Detroit on the, on the water. Uh, anyway, outside the three mile uh, limit of the country, just far enough from the Coast Guard patrol boats, the rum runners would buy their shipments uh, off Canadian fishermen and still be able to outrun the Coast Guard. It was virtually impossible to enforce the prohibition law. The uh, prohibition agents uh, lacked training, numbers to battle bootleggers. The country's 48 states at the time didn't really want to help. You know, feds, you take care of it. You enacted the law, you take care of it. Prohibition agents and cooperative local law enforcers uh, throughout the country seized warehouses filled with whiskey, busted up stills, smashed counted countless bottles of liquor. Sounds like an untouchable sense, I hope so, doesn't it? Uh, took axes to beer barrels, dumped contents into the gutters and sewers. But this guy didn't care, Al Capone. Uh, what prohibition agents and local police and state police found, uh, they couldn't enforce the laws. Uh, the feds had 3,000 agents. Local police officers took payoffs from bootleggers in exchange for looking the other way, and they tipped them off about federal raids. Al Capone was having his way with liquor rackets in Chicago. Uh, Coast Guard used speedboats, retired military ships to pursue, board, and seize vessels of rum runners smuggling liquor into the country on the Great Lakes. That was uh, you yeah, and they were taking it across the canoes yeah. and everything else. Yeah, the Atlantic Ocean, the Gulf of Mexico, and the Pacific Ocean. Uh, they enjoyed booze as well. They be the flappers. Uh, the United States involvement in World War I started in 1970, and it lasted until 1918. And while the doughboys were away, the girls had to come and not play, but take their jobs. And you know what? How are you going to keep them down to the farm after they saw a parade? Well, how are you going to keep women away from working after they saw the dollars? Uh, when the war ended, many women were used, uh, used, were used to independence. They developed a carefree attitude. Many women, but not all women, got the right to vote in 1920. The restrictions were Native American women, Asian American women, Latinx and African women, they could not vote. Uh, culture quickly shifted from women being expected 
to be wives who are subordinate to their husbands, to women valuing independence and breaking the rules. Many young women became flappers, uh, lost girls, the flappers. Uh, unlike their mothers who grew up in the 1890s, early 1900s, the grandmothers who grew up 1860, 1870, 1880s, uh, the flappers tended to go to high school and college. They devoured new books featuring confident, fun-loving adolescent heroines who hiked and camped and solved mysteries. Flappers biked, they played golf, they played tennis, and they wanted to emulate the flat-chested and hipless physiques of the adolescent boys whose freedom and lack of do domestic responsibilities they envy. Flapper dresses used to push down the breasts so it looked like they were all flat-chested. Uh, and that was the look of the day. Uh, the flappers were a great source of worry. Parents, what happened to my daughter? Educators, they're not getting educated. Physicians, you play sports like in England where they barred women's soccer on a high level. That's going to ruin your lives. Ruin your lives. And clergymen, they felt sports and higher education was ruinous. You think it was ruinous getting a higher education for women? Won't be for my granddaughters. Won't, wasn't for my daughter. Uh, and there they are, the flappers. You know, some flappers rouge their knees and painted faces on their knees to get attention. They're doing the Charleston, which came out in 1923. The post-war prosperity expressed itself in many ways. One of the first, the availability of credit. Department stores gave you credit. And you're able to buy things that were way out of your price range. Uh, you know, you paid it back. Uh, upper class luxuries, leading to the birth of consumerism. With it came the flapper dress, mass produced for public consumption. New, wait, tell me if this is this year or if it was 1925. New cosmetic companies sold skin creams to eradicate wrinkles. Uh, magazines advertised flapper hairstyles and clothing, plus extreme diets and dubious claims for the slumming effects of cigarettes and chewing gum. Some women resorted to a new vogue in cosmetic surgery, the facelift, kicking off an era of damaging self-scrutiny and obsession with weight, youthfulness, and body image. Uh, that's the Bob. That is Louise Brooks and the Bob. That is her haircut. Uh, a flapper cut her hair short into what was called the Bob. She wore shorter dresses. She rouged her knees as well as her cheeks. She painted faces on her knees. She drank alcohol, smoked cigarettes, dated multiple men before marriage, and all of a sudden there's a form of birth control as well. It's called the diaphragm. So they're able to sleep around. Uh, they went to speakeasies, which was a place where they drank alcohol provided by gangsters. Oh, there is Calvin Coolidge. Uh, and on the surface, it looked like the Coolidge presidency had a really, really good economy. Uh, but a closer look at the Coolidge prosperity suggests something else. During the years of the Coolidge prosperity, business corporations, their profits soared by 62%. Wages only went up by 7%. There were bank failures all over the place in the South and the Midwest. 464 rural banks in the Midwest and the South shut their doors in bankruptcy, while thousands of farmers lost their land. His tax cuts contributed to an uneven distribution of what? I'm talking about 2024, but I'm talking about 1925. Uh, to an even distribution of wealth and overproduction of goods. Many Americans were deeply in debt for having purchased consumer goods on um, easy credit terms. Uh, for the farmers, there was no prosperity. Uh, despite agriculture overproduction and successive attempts by Congress to provide relief, the agriculture economy of the 1920s was experiencing an ongoing depression. Large surpluses were accompanied by falling prices at a time when the American farmer was burdened by heavy debt. The Coolidge prosperity was not evenly distributed. And there is a silent cap. It was the banker, Andrew Mellon, uh, Coolidge Secretary of Treasury and one of the world's richest men who mentioned their successful tax reductions. 
The group that did not fare well during the Coolidge prosperity, well, they were the lower and middle class families. My family, at 97 Pitt Street, the Lower East Side. Uh, but the group that did well was bootleggers. Coolidge personally opposed prohibition, but sought to enforce federal law in the frame for serving liquor at the White House. Over there, how many of you remember the song, Over There? there the Yanks are coming, the Yanks are coming, right? Over there, George M. Cohen, right? Uh, the First World War and the subsequent peace settlements gave rise to new ambitions, rivalries, and tensions. People had high expectations uh, that the post war peace settlement would create a new world order and ensure that the slaughter of the First World War was never repeated. Trinity of Versailles, Woodrow Wilson, the President of the United States, the tall guy on the right, he's carving up the world along with David Lloyd George of Britain, Vittorio Orlando of Italy, George Clemenceau of France, who hated uh, David, Jordan, David uh, Lloyd George, and Wilson. Uh, the war ended November 18th, uh, November, November 11th, 1918, after four years of fighting and millions of lives lost. Treaty of Versailles, signed in June 1919, created the League of Nations, an international body intended to promote peace and prevent war. America never joined the League of Nations. That was a Wilson thing. He wanted to, uh, for various reasons. Cost, isolation, and also he was hated by certain Republicans. Uh, the treaty was an uneasy compromise as each of the victorious allies, the Brits, the Americans, France, Italy looked to pursue their own interests, and this is at the time Mussolini is beginning to amass power in Italy. Germany was forced to surrender territory, disarm, pay for the war's damages. These divisive conditions were criticized as overly vindictive by many in Britain and America. Treaty's terms caused an immediate outrage and lasting bitterness in Germany. It's an irony you should look at uh, Adolf Hitler. The Treaty of Versailles left Germany in a surprisingly strong position. It created Poland, Czechoslovakia, the Baltic states, and that put a, a buffer between them and their traditional rival, the Russians. Fighting among the new states, Poland overthrew government, uh, weakened them, and the geography of the new borders made it difficult to defend. So Germany all of a sudden has these small, relatively weak states on its eastern border. Treaty of Lausanne in 1923 would officially end World War I. Uh, the Versailles people stopped working on it in June of 1919, but the rest of the treaty comes four years later in Lausanne, Switzerland, signed by France, Britain, Italy, Japan, Greece, and Romania, along with the new Republic of Turkey. That's why Hitler had eight Jews. They believe the big lie, the big myth, the big lie. During World War I, Adolf Hitler was a soldier in the German army. At the end of the war, he and many other German soldiers like him could get over the defeat of the German Empire. The German army command spread the myth, spread the lie. The army didn't lose the war on the battlefield. They were betrayed. Well, who betrayed them? It's called a stab in the back. Hitler bought into the lie, into the myth. Jews and communists had betrayed the country and brought the left-wing government into power that wanted to throw in the towel. Uh, there is Hitler in 1920, and this is where Nazism starts, on February 20th in Munich. Uh, he delivers the Nazi party platform to a large crowd in, uh, in Munich. The German Workers' Party had existed. Hitler was a great orator. He laid out a 25-point platform. His central idea, strengthen German citizenship by excluding and controlling Jewish people and others deemed non-German. You see, here's the problem with all this. Hitler's not German. He's Austrian. So under the Hitler plan, Hitler would be deported from Germany because he's not a German. Go figure. He writes the book Mein Kampf while he's in jail in 1924. In his memoir, Propaganda Track, Mein Kampf, My Struggle, Hitler had predicted a general European war that would result in the extermination of the Jewish race in Germany. Mein Kampf was written in jail because Hitler was arrested for his participation in the Beer Hall Push, uh, November 2nd and 10th in Munich, 
when the Nazi party tried to overthrow the German government. He was released on parole in December 1924. Why do you hate the Jews? Uh, blame them for the defeat. That's the evidence, the stereotypical evidence. In the 1920s, Germany was in a major economic crisis. According to the Nazis, throwing out all the Jews would solve all the problems in Germany. While Hitler was on parole in 1925, faced the possibility of being deported uh, to his uh, Austrian homeland, and so his muscle. Uh, there were just 27,100 members of the Nazi party. He would start rebuilding the party in 1925. Uh, the Locarno Pact uh, was uh, a deal between uh, the Russians and the Germans uh, and others. Uh, the uh, treaties of Locarno, a series of treaties uh, negotiated in October in Switzerland, signed on December 1st. The pact led Germany to accept the terms of the Versailles Treaty and boundaries between France and Germany. Here's Benito Mussolini. Uh, it's generally agreed that in the speech Mussolini gave to the Italian parliament on January 3rd, in which he asserted his right to supreme power and effectively became the dictator of Italy, that's when Italy went fascist. Uh, Mussolini was able to openly operate as a dictator, styling himself El Duce, fusing the party and the fascist party. On December 24th, the decree on powers of the head of government declared the prime minister is now the head of government, and the head of government is not responsible to the parliament. Only the king could remove the head of government, and nothing could be placed on the parliament's agenda without the consent of the head of government, giving Mussolini the ability to block all consent. Chrysler. Here is Walter Chrysler. And Chrysler started in 1925, on June 6th. Uh, Chrysler Corporation was officially uh, formed by Walter P. Chrysler at the ailing Maxwell Motor Company. The first Chrysler car was introduced in 1924 for Maxwell. Uh, the company purchased the American Motor Body Company, creating a body supply source. Chrysler had arrived at the Ailing Maxwell Chandler's uh, company in the uh, early 1920s, hired to overhaul the company's troubled operations after a similar rescue job at Willie's Overland Car Company. In late 1923, the production of the Chalmers uh, for the mobile was canceled. How many New York Giants football fans are here? You root for the Giants. You're a Cleveland Browns guy, right? And you must be a Lions guy. Yeah, I'm a Lions guy. You're a Lions guy. Right now, I'm a Michigan fan. Yeah, well, Michigan, well. How come you're not wearing a sweatshirt? How are you about that? How come you're not wearing a sweatshirt? Well, he's, he's uh, He's a, he's a hero in Michigan. Jim Harbaugh, and he's going to win, yeah. right? Maybe. Anyway, Red Grange saves the National Football League. Uh, late 1925 season, the National Football League gained national recognition when the All-American halfback, Harold Red Grange, uh, before his college, college eligibility uh, was up at the University of Illinois, signed a contract with the Chicago Bears franchise. Grange was the big star of the season, quite the University of Illinois. The galloping ghost. Grange gave the pro game legitimacy. And he saved the New York Giants franchise. And for the life of me, I have no idea why the Giants have never retired the number 77. Because without Red Grange, there'd be no New York Giants, even though he never played it down for the New York Giants. The Grange signing clearly violated NFL rules against signing players before they completed their college eligibility, but the signing of Red Grange and the subsequent national barnstorming tour of the Bears team may have saved the NFL. On Thanksgiving Day, 36,000 people, the largest crowd ever to see a uh, pro football game, watched Grange and the Chicago Bears Play the Chicago Cardinals at Wrigley Field. It wasn't called Wrigley Field in those days, it was called Cubs Park or Wegman Stadium. Uh, at the beginning of December, the Bears won an eight game, 12 day barnstorming tour St. Louis, Philadelphia, New York, Washington, Boston, Pittsburgh, Detroit, 
back to Chicago. And they, um, they all became NFL Uh Yes. On December 6th, a crowd of 73,000 watched the Bears play the Giants at the Polo Grounds. Uh, the contest set a pro record for attendance. More importantly, he wiped out the New York Giants' debt and put Tim Mara. Oh, by the way, Tim Mara was a bootlegger just in case you didn't know that. He was one of those Irish Catholic bootleggers that the uh, KKK didn't like, right? Uh, in the black, by over $18,000, helping assure the future of the troubled NFL franchise in New York. The uh, Pro Football Polo Grounds record was beaten when the Bears defeated the Los Angeles Tigers in the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum in front of 75,000 fans. This thing is still on, 99 years later. It starts as the WSN Barn Dance. Uh, on November 28th, a month after Nashville's WSM Radio's first show, National Life and Accidental Insurance Company hired George D. Hay, a prominent announcer and program director, known for his National Barn Dance program at WLS in Chicago. Oh, WLS? That stands for the world's largest store. It was owned by Sears at the time. Uh, Hay launched the WSM Barn Dance with Uncle Jimmy Thompson, 77-year-old fiddle player. Uh, WSM, which is the uh, short for the insurance company's slogan, We Shield Millions. The name of the show would change. It would become the Grand Old Opera. And speaking of uh, Sears, that is now the Willis Tower used to be known as the Sears Tower. Uh, tried to get it in the picture sunset, but missed the sunset a little bit. Uh, on February 2nd, as an experiment in the North Mondale Sears Roebuck and Complex, uh, company complex in Chicago, Richard Ward Sears started uh, a mail order house in Minneapolis in 1886, calling it R.W. Sears uh, Watch Company. Uh, that year, he met Albert Curtis, who wrote a uh, watch repair. In 1887, Sears and Robo relocated the business to Chicago. The company published Richard Sears' first mail order catalog. How many of you used the Sears catalog before you used Amazon? What'd you buy? What'd you buy? Anyway, uh, the catalog offered watches, diamonds, jewelry. 1924, the company decided to go into the brick and mortar business, and uh, it became the mainstay of American business. Uh, the 1925 legacy out of the Scopes Monkey <coughs> Trial. Anybody see that movie, Inherit the Wind? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 1955, the play written by Jerome Lawrence and Robert E. Lee, not that one about the Scopes trial called Inherit the Wind, debuted in Dallas, Texas. The well-reviewed play has had many revivals worldwide. A uh, film based on the play starring Spencer Tracy and Frederick Barch from here in 1960, Inherit the Wind, has been remade for television several times. John Scopes and the story of his trial were featured on an episode or in an episode of the television game show To Tell the Truth on October 10, 1960. Uh, in June 1967, Scopes wrote Center of the Storm, memoirs of John T. Scopes. The Buck Rat was repealed that same year. There is the KKK. Uh, probably the most decisive factor in the Klan's downfall took place in 1925 when a major scandal broke involving one of the Klan's most powerful and celebrated leaders, David C. Stevenson, the powerful Grand Cyclops of Indiana, whose power extended beyond Indiana to several other Midwest uh, states. Uh, Stevenson abducted, raped, and murdered a young woman, for which, after a sensational trial, he was sent to prison. His fall into disgrace was a major blow to the KKK, uh, doing untold damage among its faithful. In the civil rights era of the 1950s and 60s, the Klan came back, but would fade away. The Great Gatsby was largely considered forgettable and a commercial failure when it was published. It was only after World War II, during which free copies of the novels were sent to US soldiers overseas, that the book was re-examined and became a core part of high school curriculums. 
And I was in high school, and I had to read The Great Gatsby. I kind of wondered whether or not initial sales actually really reflected how good or bad the book was. Uh, and there is The Great Gatsby. 1925, Legacy of Prohibition. 1932, Franklin Roosevelt ran for president on a platform that included uh, a call for Prohibition's repeal. He easily defeated the incumbent, Herbert Hoover. February 1933, Congress adopted a resolution proposing the 21st Amendment to the Constitution that would repeal the 18th. The amendment was submitted to the states, and in December 1933, Utah, of all places, Utah, uh, provided the 36th and final necessary vote for ratification. The main law remained in effect in one form or another until the repeal of the National Prohibition in 1934. There are the flappers. The flapper lifestyle and look disappeared uh, in the Roaring Twenties era of glitz and glamour on October 29th, 1929, when the Wall Street crash occurred. Unable to afford the latest trends and lifestyle, once vibrant flapper women returned to their drop hemlines and flatten dress disappeared. 1963, Betty Friedan released the book, The Feminine Estate, which referenced the flappers. The book was the start of the 1960s women's rights movement. There is uh, Coolidge. Historians do not rank the Coolidge presidency very high. In fact, he's in the bottom third of the people who served as president of the United States. He's rated poorly for crisis leadership, lack of imagination, and failing to work for equal justice for all Americans. And yet, he made Native Americans American citizens in 1924. They were not American citizens prior to 1924. He refused to use the country's economic boom to help struggling farmers and workers in flailing industries. Some of his policies led to the 1929 stock market crash, although he was out of office for more than seven months when the bottom fell out of the market. No Nazis. It's me in uh, Rockstadt, Germany, former East Germany. Adolf Hitler in the Nazi party rose to power in 1932. Germany annexed uh, Austria and Czechoslovakia in 1938. Germany invaded Poland September 1st, 1939, which started World War II. Japan bombed Pearl Harbor December 7th, 1941. Mussolini and Hitler were allies during World War II. The war ended in 1945. The Nazi party has been outlawed in Germany. And there is Red Grange. And if you own that program, you're sitting on a few thousand dollars worth of memorabilia in decent shape. New York football giants against the Chicago Bears. That was 15 cents. When they bid by Red Grange and his agent, C.C. Pyle, to buy a piece of Bears was rejected by the coach and owner, George Ellis, the two formed their own league. The American Football League in 1926, Grange played for the New York Yankees. The league folded after a year. The Yankees, though, joined the NFL, but in the third game of the 1927 season, Grange suffered such a severe knee injury, he was never the same dashing runner he had been. And Sears, Sears Robo, that actually is uh, in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, when it was up there speaking on the cruise ship. Uh, the Bar Dance was renamed the Grand Old Opera two years after uh, it started as uh, the big Bar Dance. Uh, in an unscripted moment of uh, a talk by the host George D. A. December 10th, 1927. His turn of the phrase, Grand Old Opry, affecting a rural southern accent, resonated with listeners, and was an instant sensation. The Grand Old Opry remains a major country music showcase. There are just 12 Sears stores functioning in the United States as of October 26. 2023. The department store once operated 3,500 stores. And everybody in here was in a Sears store once, right? Everybody. 2020, in 2018, company filed for bankruptcy after years of declining sales. And the Chrysler names. Now the Chrysler name is still selling cars. It's not Chrysler anymore. It's a European company that owns the name, but they're still selling. So. Any questions, any comments? Your turn. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you. So, um,
Anybody have any comments? What are you going to talk about next time? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, no idea. No idea. Yeah. Yeah, five or ten bucks. That's where they got the money from. Yeah, five or ten bucks back in the day. They had a lot of money. So they survived on a personal date, donation type thing. Yeah, that too. Yeah, that too. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, hope, uh, hope you enjoyed the uh, little talk. Okay. You want to go home? Yeah, go in a minute.